the title is obviously clickbait. Uh, DevOps is not uh, dead, but we have your attention, so that's uh, great. It's awesome to speak in front of real humans. Uh, it's not that I you know, wasn't speaking in front of humans before, but if you, I do a lot of Zoom webinars and everything, and it's a, it's a lot less tangible than having all of you here in the room. And so thank you very much for having me. Um, and I'm very excited to share this topic with all of you that is very, very uh, dear to my heart. Be, like, it feels like there is a pre-pandemic um, era for platform engineering and a post-pandemic uh, era. Um, I've been speaking about platform engineering for a long time and nobody, or not many people listened. I was very, I, I remember my first webinar, we had two attendees. Um, and uh, then in um, Christmas, in October 2019, we were sitting in a room in uh, Berlin and we thought, hey, how do we call that thing we're building as platform engineers? And we said, well, let's call it internal developer platform. Uh, and then in uh, Christmas 2020, I wrote a site called internaldeveloperplatform.org and then platformengineering.org later. And uh, now post pandemic, uh, those sites have over 350,000 uh, impressions. And so it's really you know, great to see how this is uh, picking up. I, what I want to speak about um, quickly um, during the session is how what I'm observing in, as general trends in platform engineering, uh, and then I want to give a little bit of a step-by-step -step guide to platform engineering in general. I've been seeing, I'm, I'm seeing around 250 platform setups a year uh, through my job. I do a lot of stuff in the community. Um, and I see certain patterns on how these platform transformations um, can go successful or how they cannot go successful. Like a good amount of them are also not very successful. And I think uh, they have a huge amount of benefits if you play it well. Um, and yeah, I just want to share some insights on how um, I think one can avoid those mistakes. Now, I think the, the core reason why we're having this new thing that we're shouting out and yet another buzzword is that DevOps is often the victim of misinterpretation. Um, we've had this, um, and I'm going to cover timeline quickly, uh, but this idea of just saying, hey, um, everybody is now building everything. You, we're just breaking off the barriers. Everybody has to do Terraform now. Um, and if you really think about uh, what that often resulted into in companies is uh, fights and burnouts, and we're trying to control the situation by uh, cultural transformation, but it's often um, not really, uh, not, not super simple. The reality is that the world we live in today is um, dirty, chaotic, and complex. The average application has much, much more components than the applications we were confronted with in 2010, we have a lot more uh, tools in the tool chain. I always hear people like, oh, yet another tool, and why do we need one more tool? Um, but the reality is that we're building applications for a global scale, for a global audience. The amount of users, the amount of redundancy, the amount of reach that we have in 2022 is a step function larger than anything we served in, in 2010. And so those digital assembly lines, if you want, um, just are very complex and uh, produce a lot of um, overhead. Now, um, if you recall in 2006, I think, a guy called Werner Vogel, the uh, CTO at uh, Amazon Web Services, um, like coined that term, you build it, you run it, right? But I think we have to understand that that guy coined the term in the context of his time. And as I uh, lined out, the times were very different it was a time that was uh, significantly uh, simpler. So the, the pink curve here is a proxy for, um, for cloud native adoption by just taking the container adoption. I think what's interesting and what we see as a, as a pattern and a repeating pattern is that there's around a five year lag function between the start of going cloud native and the uh, and when teams say, hey, we need to control this chaos and we need to uh, look at platforms. That was the case earlier, and this is the case now. Why is there so much conversations about platform engineering? That's not because we have large marketing budgets. That's because um, now people actually run into that five-year uh, lag function. Um, Amazon, EKS, GKE, 
especially for Europe, have not been around more than three, four years. And now we're seeing, hey, you know, the, the, the original idea that we had probably uh, doesn't work the way we thought. And you can th see this with a good amount of examples, uh, Zalando, five-year lag, um, even GitHub, five-year lag. There is uh, Jason Warner, the, was the uh, VP of engineering at Heroku, then later joined um, GitHub and started to um, say, like, the way we do things here on, on Amazon that, that, that can't go on like this, and then started to build a platform, basically Heroku, on top of Amazon uh, Web Services. And throughout the last five years, those early platform teams have iterated and learned and done a lot of mistakes. And um, this is, the, and uh, those are one of the um, key insights that I want to uh, share. So the bottom line um, analysis is if you just establish the idea of you build it, you run it without layered abstractions, without giving people the opportunity to actually choose how much cognitive load they would want to consume as individual contributors, then you probably have them at risk of burning out. And that by no means should result into skipping your DevOps practices. DevOps is not that. That is plain clickbait. But um, it should result into thinking about the idea of how much people can actually consume as additional burden on a daily basis, we should actually, that I think is that, and we should reflect on this a little more. Now, um, we're shifting into that platform world and to that idea of platform engineering, and that has a different impact on different personas. The uh, key players in that game theoretical situation are our developers and are our platform or SRE teams or cloud ops or we have a hundred names and they change um, every two months. And so for the application developers, what they actually want is self-service. They want at the same time a reduction of cognitive load and all of that without abstraction. And that is something that is easier said than done. Making something simpler without taking away context, that's really what it's all about. There were so many platforms that we built that were just layers on top of something and would hide or abstract developers away and they would not actually understand what would be happening under the hood. If you do that, then you do platform engineering wrong. It's really about making sure there is less, there are less gaps in the team, making sure there are less waiting times but making sure this, all of this is with reduced cognitive load and without actually abstracting uh, them away. If you have a CLI that you do like giving S3 bucket and that executes a Terraform file and the developer can just take that or leave it or otherwise uh, go back to the platform team to request this uh, from a human, then you don't actually win something. So that is what, ma what, what makes um, platform engineering um, and doing that properly so difficult. And then from the perspective of the platform, from the ops team, from the SRE teams, we actually want to drive what I'm calling standardization by design. We want to design systems that if you follow the golden paths, they have a self-standardizing mechanism built in. We want to reduce ticket ops. That's something that we're seeing over and over again. Jira and ServiceNow tickets, can you debug this? Can you spin up an environment? Can we, can, can we um, can, we, can you help me debug that deployment? And we want to get into a situation where as ops teams, we can actually proactively work on um, hitting our SLAs and um, really improving uh, the status quo. So it's all about reaching focus and uh, aligning those two players. And because of that, we're building these internal developer platforms. Everybody's always asking like, how will that platform look and are there blueprints and uh, why is there no off-the-shelf solution? And the answer is probably there will never be an off-the-shelf solution. There is no satisfying answer to that question because if there would be an off-the-shelf solution, then that would be Heroku. And I've, I'm always saying if you can use Heroku, please use Heroku. But if you need to run on hyperscalers with lot of, lots of different complex tool chains, then you actually you are confronted with the task of building your own platform. These platforms look differently at Deutsche Bank and they look differently at Airbnb. They look different whether you look at e-commerce or if you look at healthcare because you need to localize them to the demand of the industry 
and the actual specific audience and the user and the users our development team. It's in the end a contract between the platform engineering teams giving you the defaults and the development teams consuming this. So before I go into that step-by-step -step guide, quickly an analogy um, in comparison to the um, you know, automotive industry, which is obviously the only industry Germany was able to do properly, and so which is why as a German I always have to speak about uh, cars. Um, if you look at an immature organization, immature organizations tell teams to build a car, they give them a credit card and say, hey, you can find the raw materials over there. And then when they have problems and they struggle, they send in DevOps teams and say, hey, can you please help those uh, and um, figure things out. The next step function would be you have, you, you tell them to build a car, you give them the credit card, you tell them where to find the raw materials, then DevOps helps them organize and cloud operations can cut the materials a little bit to help them ease their pain. And advanced organizations, again, tell them to build a car, they build a platform, team that prepares a platform and then developers build on top and DevOps help them structure the work. And this is how I see the relationship between those two functions. But that's all good and fine. Another buzzword, another guy from Germany, you know, saying unstructured things. But the question is, how do you now actually approach this and how do you take the first step? And this is where, and we're all learning, so this is early days, this is a pattern that I've observed that works fairly well. Step one is that from day one, if you want, you need to think about the platform as a product. And that has been said before, but it's not really been followed, if you want. Like Manuel Pais, Matthew Skelton with Team Topologies have always said, hey, you need to treat your developers as users, you have to have a roadmap, but I can't stress enough how important that is. The teams that I'm working with that have at least a part-time product owner or like project manager on that topic are a step function more likely to actually be successful. You cannot just have a couple of um, open source loving people that are super passionate and take them into a room and then just hope something comes out. That just me. that is very rarely, they, they need a lot more structure. And from day one, you need to articulate this as this will evolve, this will iterate, we will start small. And you need to apply all of the usual things that you would also apply to a product. That means a roadmap, that means user interviews, that means clear KPIs, how you're actually measuring success. And if success is only a tiny little small thing that you start with, it has to be measurable and it has to be um, analytical and very well thought through and managed. Hi, we are Ethicode and we organize the DevOps conference. What developers really want is to see their software live. Minimizing the time from idea to software delivery really makes sense. Whether you invest in CI, CD, cloud native development or continuous experimentation and learning. We would love to speak to you about how to remove the pain and uncertainty from your software development lifecycle. You can find us at ethico.com. The links are in the description. Have a great time with the DevOps conference talks. Now, the next key thing is that you need to prioritize what to start with. That is I call it the prioritization fallacy because many teams um, that form platform engineering groups sit down and say, hmm, there is so much we could do, where do we get started? And then they often start with the things they feel are most obvious. So for instance, they think about the life cycle of an application. And then they say, well, let's start where the application start and or the workload starts or the microservice starts. Let's actually really optimize how we create new microservices. You know, we'll have a beautiful user interface and we'll press a button and then we have a new Node.js service and it will already be wired up to our authentication and everybody will be happy. But the, that all sounds great, but the thing that this doesn't answer is, is that actually what provides tangible results? Are you deriving any return on investment from that particular action 
optimizing that creation of a new service, is that actually what will help you ship faster, innovate faster? Will that have any impact on your um, on, on the, on the um, top line of your business? The second approach that I'm often seeing is that they say, well, we start with the life cycle of the developers. When developers join us, we want them to onboard very fast. Our current onboarding time is three months. We want to bring this down to two months because we believe then that then we will actually boost output. That might be or it might not be. You don't know that. You cannot start by, like you cannot build features based on what you think feels best. You cannot start a platform or build and optimize these platform components by just starting with what you think is most obvious or what you care about, about most. And there is, an, there is a, like a certain mechanism that I'm always recommending, and it's take a white piece of paper, sit down and ask yourself, what are the things that we're doing that go beyond the simple update of an image? Because in the end, that's why you need a platform. If you're just staying in the Git push lane, things are figured out, right? You do your Git push, you update your image, uh, life is good. But if you go beyond that simple update of an image, this is actually where in the modern tool chain things fall apart. So sit down, the white piece of paper in front of you, and then just note down how often you do things that, like, first of all, you note down all of the things that go beyond the simple update of an image. I just noted a few here, um, adding an environment variable, changing configs, um, refactoring, spinning up a new environment, then your case spinning up a new service, onboarding developers. That will be a very, very long list. Then ask yourself, against 100 deployments, how often do I do this? In 5% of cases, my colleagues change an environment variable. Otherwise, they just do git push update. Then you ask yourself, how much time does that take per individual action per function? So how long does it take for developers to add an environment variable, and how much time is involved from operations, including error rates, um, some things that go sideways, and uh, exchanges between teams. And you build that long list, and then you multiply this times the, um, basically times your average salary, and then times the total number of deployments. And then you have your forced rank prioritization. And the trick is that you cannot just do that yourself in the platform engineering team. You need to be very, very careful how you actually ask the different functions of your team. I call that the loudest voice fallacy. A lot of platform engineering teams build tools towards the loudest voice in the team. The problem, and those are usually the very senior developers that say, hey, I don't have a problem with Terraform. Everything is great. I, I want to do everything uh, myself. The problem with that is, as engineers, and I include myself, if, some, if somebody is very confidently saying, hey, this is, is not difficult, then I would never dare stand up and say, hey, this is actually very difficult for me. So if we optimize on the loudest voice, we tend to optimize or build systems that are too complex. So actually have one-on-one -on -one conversations with representative users from different teams. Talk to the junior front-end developer, talk to the PM, uh, talk to the senior kernel hacker. Make sure you hear every single voice and then build the prioritization against that weighted average. The next step is don't try to solve everything at once. There is a reason why there is no vendor out there that is giving you a platform experience on VM, Kubernetes, and Lambda. The reason is it's extremely difficult even for well-funded large engineering teams to build functional platforms across all of these systems. So you, especially as a first attempt, you will not be able to nail that across all platforms. So you need to come up with a, an assumption what your, let's call it, lowest common tech denominator is. And the answer is probably Kubernetes, containerized, um, running with managed services, whatever the answer is for you. It could also be Lambda, it could also be VMware, it doesn't matter. But you need to think about what do I believe my lowest common tech denominator in the next five years is. 
And then you need to do hard triaging, optimizing on, on that case. And that's often like an uncomfortable answer for the enterprise because we all have our, you know, um, we all have our nasty old services that we need to transform, and I'm, I'm aware of that. But to start off with, you need to start small, and you need to start with that lowest common tech denominator. And then you need to make sure that you don't roll this out or test this on many people. You need to resist the temptation of doing the Big Bang show and everybody will clap. Because the, the, the likelihood of people clapping at all is very, very low. The, that's why I always say, if you have that lowest tech denominator, figure out what is that team in your group, and there is always that team, that is famous for embracing innovations early, being evangelists, being happy to try out new stuff. And you want that team to have an application that is on your lowest co uh, common tech denominator for the future. So if we stay in the Kubernetes example, containerized on AKS, GKE, EKS, Ranger, whatever. And um, then you want to focus on them. You do the ROI calculation for them again. And you really get them excited of being the guinea pigs. High buy-in from that one team. That's step number four. Then you think about the general design of the architecture. And I'm seeing roughly two patterns emerge on platform uh, designs. Number one is what we refer to as static internal developer platforms. The static refers to the approach of configuration management. That's the 90% case at the moment. Um, we have our IDE, we have static configuration files in our version control systems that could be our workload, YAMLs per environment, infrastructure as code. We have our CI pipelines and then we have a CD system like an operator or whatever, like a controller to actually sync that state with the, the, the application. The stuff that I'm advocating for is dynamic configuration management. That's maybe 10%, but it's rising really quickly. And the idea is still everything code-based, but that you're describing your application um, as what we call a declarative application model, a model of layered abstractions. That model of layered abstractions gives the individual contributor the choice how low they want to go in the abstraction layer, if you want. You have a workload, you have a workload specification that describes the relationship between workloads and dependent resources in an agnostic way. That's basically one file that works across all different um, environments. There is an open source project called SCORE that is doing exactly that. Then you have shared values and secrets that you can inject depending on the context. Then you have a workload profile. Think of this like default configurations. Kubernetes world, that could be an empty Helm chart. And then you have your resource definitions. What are all of the resources I can wire up to? Cross-plane files, Terraform files, whatever. So what we've basically done is we've built that model. It's in your repository. And now we have a contract between the developers and the platform teams. The platform teams can do the cross-cutting things below, like the workload profile and the resource definitions. The individual contributors can decide whether they want to stay on the higher abstract level, the workload and the workload specification, or whether they also want to go down under the hood and actually customize the things from the ground up. And what, that, what we then do and what we build is, in the end, a platform orchestrator that's doing that matching of the two worlds. That's basically taking the request from the pipeline, git push, and con uh, the tag would be, let's say, staging and then creating the actual config files for staging and matching staging infrastructure. Same for local, same for prod, and this, that way we get a high consistency in the actual configs, and we get that, um, we, we leave the individual contributor with a decision on how much you build it, you run it, they actually want. So that's the key step number five, choosing that pattern. And then you start building. And the trick is to build something that is very small, but that is 10x better than what the team is using today. Because it is much harder to convince engineers to adopt platforms. That's the number one reason 
that will knock you out as platform engineers is a lack of developer adoption. Because it needs to be a step function better for them to actually say, okay, that's something that it actually makes sense for me to change my workflow um, into that direction. And so you need to build against where your return on investment is. You need to double down and spend too much time on this one thing with that Lighthouse application that will make your evangelist love that change. If you follow that pattern, you'll see that the evangelists will go to the other teams and say, hey, this is a lot better than what we have right now, and it will start spreading very, very fast. Like, I've seen enormously fast spreads of platforms that follow um, this approach. And then you need to embrace that it's a very, very long journey. You need to iterate and iterate and iterate, treat it as a product, continuously invest into those different things, stay very disciplined in your user feedback and in the measurements of the different um, KPIs. I wish you a lot of luck with this. I would uh, encourage you to be part of those communities. They are um, open and um, we always value contributions. And if you want to speak or write uh, for any of those, we would be very happy to have you there. We do around one webinar uh, a week at this point. And so I hope to see you on some of these communities very soon. Thank you very much. And we have time for some questions, if you have questions for Casper. Who do you see as a product owner for such a platform team? So first of all, I don't think that they need to be full-time right away. I think you can start very small and just um, taking a fairly technical, uh, like it should be a fairly technical profile. So um, has been developer before or has been a PO in very technical environments, uh, definitely. Like those need to, it's not pure project management, like they need, really need to understand the reality of the, the, the developers in front of them to, to, make, to make a difference. But any project management is better than n none, so. Yeah, but I, I would say like the amount of, the, the mind, amount of platform teams that use, uh, that, that manage or structure their teams at all is very low. <laughs> it's maybe like 30%. I mean, this is just me guessing, but it's astounding. Question over here. Mm -hmm. You talked about a open source project or product or whatever that uh, where you could specify inside your repo what type of application this was and how it relates to the infrastructure that it should be running on. What was the name of that again? Uh, sure. So this is called SCORE. Um, the idea is, so we've been using this for... Um, Three, 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 three and a half years. And, but we thought, okay, this is something that should be completely agnostic of the provider and should be open. So um, the idea here is to say, hey, I'm describing, let's take, the, this is one file that describes one workload and its relationship to the rest of the architecture. Um, and it basically says, hey, I'm a workload. My name is Hello World. Um, and I have a couple of, uh, you know, like a container. And I have a resource dependency on a, in that case, um, data of type volume. And I'm, that's all I'm specifying. And I'm, I'm doing that on a workload by workload basis. And it's one file that works across all environment. Uh, the, basically, the, basically, the experience for the developer would be to take the CLI to run score compose and it will create the local files. And then you run that for staging and it creates staging files and matches staging infrastructure. Uh, and you can then do that for prod, and because it has that level of abstraction, it works across, um, like it starts with uh, a reference implementations for Compose, Helm, I think Customize, Captain, Humanitech, Cloud Run, and then it's, uh, we're adding Lambda and a couple of other uh, elements. Thank you very much, Casper. Just give it a